you know, th there is no way that these subjects should not become mainstream in science. The only place that is hostile to such study is academia. And you ask yourself, how is that possible? Because academia is supposed to be about blue sky, research, you know, about evidence. So if we hear about anomalies, about objects that we cannot explain easily, then scientists should be thrilled at the opportunity to learn something new. Instead, I can tell you that when there was a colloquium about uh, Oumuamua, this strange mm -hmm. object that was discovered 2017 at Harvard, when I left the room, a colleague of mine that worked on rocks for decades, he said, Oumuamua is so weird, I wish it never existed. That's exactly the opposite of what a scientist should say. A scientist should say, Oumuamua is so weird, let's study objects like it in more detail so we can figure it out. The childhood curiosity, we lose it when we become the adults in the room. And that's very bad if academia is dominated yeah. by people pretending to be the adults in the room. What's weird about it? What's weird? Because, yeah. uh, that this question... No, what's weird about Oumuamua? Because ah. I, I've seen a bunch of different things, how it travels, the speed, how big it is, the size of Noah's Ark, all the stuff you read. But well, what's weird about it? Right, so... Well, first of all, the reason I was intrigued is because a decade before it was discovered, I wrote the first paper that forecasted how many objects as big as a football field should be observed by this telescope in Hawaii. And we predicted nothing. Not only nothing, the chance is less than a percent for it to see anything. Then it was discovered because it came close to Earth. It was not discovered because it was interstellar. That was not the reason. It just came close to Earth within a sixth of the Earth-Sun separation. And they flagged it in Hawaii as a near-Earth object that w w is worth their attention because the entire survey was geared around finding objects that can threaten humanity. You know, if they collide with Earth, there would be a huge uh, devastation. You know, we know the dinosaurs died mm -hmm. 66 million years ago. Yep. We are smarter than they are. We have telescopes. They didn't look up and they died. So humans have a better future because we can alert ourselves. So there was this telescope looking and then this object was found. That was a surprise to me. We didn't expect rocks based on what we know about the solar system coming from other stars. So I said, what is this? And then there... You know, the people who discovered Oumuamua started reporting about unusual properties of it. Even in the first discovery paper, it was said that it's most likely flat in its shape, which is quite unusual and has a very extreme shape because the amount of sunlight reflected from it changed by a factor of 10 as it was tumbling. And that's unusual. At most, you see a factor of three when you have an elongated object. But here, just think about a piece of paper tumbling in the wind, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the chance of it lining up with your view such that you see just the thin, uh, you know, like razor thin uh, hey, edge of yeah. it is very small. So most, if you see a variation by a factor of 10 in the area projected on the sky, that means it's really thin. It's very unusual. And so that was the first thing that was unusual about it. And then it was pushed away from the sun by some mysterious force which, without showing any cometary evaporation, no rocket effect to push it. The question is, what was pushing it? Uh, and, uh, you know, the only thing I could think of, given that there was no gas or dust evaporated from it, and you really needed 10% of the mass of the object to get evaporated in order to push it by a strong enough force, the way we see in comets, there was clearly no such gas that we are familiar with in the case of comets. So I said, maybe it's just the reflection of sunlight, which is pushing it. And for that, the object had to be very thin, like a sail or like a surface of a spaceship that was ripped apart and you just see the surface being pushed by reflecting sunlight. And amazingly, three years later, in September 2020, there was another object discovered by the same telescope in Hawaii called 2020 SO. It was also pushed by reflect reflection of sunlight. That was verified. And moreover, had no cometary evaporation. And after a few weeks, the astronomers said, oh, this one is actually 
a rocket booster that NASA launched in 1966. It's just the shell of, um, of uh, 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 lunar uh, mission. Uh, and because of that, it had a very thin wall and uh, a large surface Who, who's area. Who's saying this? Who's saying that that's what it is? Oh, the, the same astronomers that discovered Oumuamua. And the point is, there was never a paper written about it. But here is an example of a technological object showing the same qualitative behavior of Oumuamua. We know it's technological because we produced it. The question is, who produced Oumuamua? So who did? I don't know, because the astronomers, after, you know, had very limited data collected, I just said, let's leave it on the table. It looked so weird. Let's leave it on the table as a possibility that it's uh, technological in origin. And at first, I should say, the paper that I submitted for publication in the Astrophysical Journal was accepted within three days for publication. The referee said, yes, this possibility makes a lot of sense because we realize the object is flat and it may be a light sail. And everyone was supportive until... A few days later, where I had a television crews at the doorstep of my home, you know, asking me, do you think we are not alone? And then I flew to Germany the, the, that day uh, to a conference the, in Berlin, uh, the Falling Walls. And uh, as I, when I arrived there, I, my inbox was full of messages from Good Morning America to all kinds. And they, were, they arranged at that conference a special room for all the reporters that wanted to speak with me, including an Italian reporter who shouted from the back of the room, do you think that you're Galileo? And I said, I'm not thinking I'm anything. I'm, you know, I'm just a farm boy. I'm just saying this object, this object looks weird. We should study objects like it in the future. It could be technological. That's all I said. And then once the media got a lot of attention of this, my colleagues changed direction. They started to push back and as of now, they are attacking me personally. There was a New York Times article where you can see some comments. One of them says, you know, uh, we are sick of Avi Loeb's wild speculation. And I say, why are you sick? I, I just, I wish you will be healthy and prosperous. I, I don't want you to be sick. I am going after evidence. I cannot go after evidence regarding Oumuamua because it's far away now. We can't study it. I, I discovered uh, another object, this meteor from 2014 that the U.S. government found, and it was interstellar in origin. The U.S. Space Command confirmed it in an official letter to NASA at the 99.999% that it came from outside the solar system. So the U.S. Department of Defense came to my defense and they took time out of their day job and said, for the benefit of science, we confirm this. And as a result, I organized an expedition to go there to the meteor path and collect any materials left from it. So I'm just trying to get as much evidence as possible. This is the scientific method. Why would anyone be sick of checking the evidence? The only way I can think of explaining it is that those people who pretend to be a scientist are actually opposed to the method of science as revealing new knowledge because they have a huge investment in past knowledge. They interpret everything in the sky as rocks. And as a result, if someone says, oh, maybe it's not a rock, they go crazy. Is it like the risk of being wrong of what they've had? predisposition beliefs that they've collectively bought into and they kind of have a hard time stepping away from it? Yeah, but think about it. It's so, <laughs> we are talking about science yeah. where I'm trying to collect evidence and people are opposed and call it a wild speculation. This is not a, it's a possibility that I'm trying to figure out by collecting evidence. That's exactly the scientific method. I worked in cosmology where we don't know the dark matter and for, you know, 90 years, we haven't figured out what dark matter is. There were billions of dollars invested in experiments. The most recent is the Large Hadron Collider that looked for supersymmetry. The dark matter may be some particle with a new symmetry of nature. Everyone said, yeah, that should be it. And $10 billion were put in the Large Hadron Collider, part of the mainstream of physics. And we looked for it. We didn't find it. 
Nobody says that was a wild speculation. It was a mistake to invest $10 billion in the Large Hadron Collider because that's the way science is done. We spent $10 billion in that. Exactly. We haven't found the dark matter yet. I say that is the way science is done. You have an idea about what the dark matter is. You go and search for it. It costs money. If you say it's an extraordinary claim, therefore, you know, I don't want to engage in it because it needs extraordinary evidence. Nobody said that about supersymmetry, that it's an extraordinary. Why? Because there was a contingency of people saying, oh, that's very natural. Let's go and see. And people got awards. I can tell you a story. I went um, to breakfast uh, half a year ago where I sat next to a string theorist, a very accomplished one. And that is celebrated as the frontiers of physics, even though they work on extra dimensions that we don't have any experimental evidence for. For several decades, these people, the theoretical physics community, is working on ideas related to dimensions beyond the three that we are familiar with. But there is no evidence for it. Nobody says that's a wild speculation. I'm sick of it. Nobody says that. People say, okay, well, that's mathematical gymnastics. It's beautiful to see. We might find it in a century from now. And they celebrate it. You know, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Brian Greene, they all say it's the frontier of physics, even though physics is supposed to be guided by experimental evidence. But there is this whole community of mainstream physicists working on something that was never tested experimentally and doesn't have a chance of being tested in our lifetime. And they don't have any problem with that. That's perfectly fine. But my point is that at the same time that this happens in the mainstream of, of physics, there is pushback and ridicule in studying, looking for evidence of real things that we observe in the sky, trying to figure them out, which is the tradition of physics, guided by anomalies, let's figure them out. If we find that, that we have a simple explanation by collecting the evidence, we will move on, forget about it. But let's collect the evidence. If for 90 years, we will invest billions of dollars and not find anything, we will be exactly at the same point as dark matter searches are right now. But so far, no federal funding was given to the search for objects, scientific search for objects, that could be technological from outside the solar system, near Earth. No, because you have thinking by committees, committees of mainstream scientists who are engaged for decades in arguing that everything in the sky is rocks, everything is stones, the stone age of science. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.